hello people my name is Javier Velasco Suarez and this is my very first recording for a tentative post podcast possible podcast with a tentative name ask a Catholic theist all right I'm I engage with people in, in YouTube comments mostly and um, and I answer questions about these issues about belief in God and about the Catholic faith mostly and several people have encouraged me in, in the comment section um, and the funny thing is all of them that um, do not agree with my with my view of the world so theists and anti-catholic have uh, advised me that I should have a YouTube channel so here it is let's see if they are right so I'm gonna start the first this first episode of this uh, potential podcast with a common question about one of the arguments for the existence of God that is called the moral argument and one question that I received recently is why would you think that God is morally superior to any other thinking entity so it makes sense that if we think that God is the authority who dictates dictates our moral rules Wait a second. No, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't really make sense. The question is assuming that that the authority who dictates the moral rules for uh, a segment of any population is allegedly sup morally superior than everybody else. But this is not really the case. And... Um, and I'm, I'm most, mostly assuming that the guy was right, that the, the questioner was right. But um, <laughs> we know plenty of cases of, of legislators in our, in our countries, whatever country you are from, that make rules for you and they are not necessarily morally superior than the rest of the population. Be it as it may, let's assume that the premise is right, that the one who dictates the rules has to be morally superior, and I'm gonna address that, um, is it address or address? Address that question as if it is, as if it's really necessary for, for God to be morally superior. So my first point is that it really make, makes no sense to think of God in, in that way. We need to think of God um, to have the right uh, mindset to think about God. We have to think in terms of creator and creatures. So we are God's creatures. So let's think of uh, other examples of that kind of relationship, like for example, Shakespeare, Hamlet, or Beethoven and one measure of the Ninth Symphony, or the Ninth Symphony in general, or all his his musical works, or Michelangelo, Buonarroti, and the David, or his works in general. So does it make sense, for example, to to ask, is Hamlet or Shakespeare a better writer? Who is the better writer? Or is it is Beethoven smarter than the first note of the Ninth Symphony? Or does it make sense to ask who can run faster, Michelangelo or the David? Of course, of course it doesn't make sense. And even in those relationships, that I'm exemplifying, 
that I'm using to exemplify our relationship with God, they don't really make justice to the infinite distance that exists between the universe and us in the universe and its creator. Let's suppose that you are a fiction writer and you're about to write a novel uh, with the character named Siegfried in it. You haven't written the first word yet and you haven't even told anybody about it. So Siegfried exists only in your head and his existence depends entirely on you. If you never get to write in the novel and if you completely forget about Siegfried, he will completely cease to be. It will be really as if he never existed. The moment you forget all, God forbid, you pass away and you never told, told, you never told anybody about Siegfried, <laughs> you cease to exist and Siegfried cease to exist. Now imagine that you are God. God is the necessary being, okay? I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking you to, be, I'm not trying to prove that he's a necessary being. I'm, I'm, I'm um, asking you to take it as a, a, a working hypothesis, okay? So imagine that you are God and God is the necessary being and he is, his creation power, his power has no limits. Whatever you create in your mind will automatically come into being. You are, however, at a disadvantage in one sense, what any human creator, if you are God, because there is nothing you can use. There is nothing else. There is no pre-existent prime matter that you can merge with your idea, with that idea that you have about Siegfried in your head. Or let's suppose that uh, you're a sculptor now. You're not a writer anymore. You're a sculptor. You're like Michelangelo. Michelangelo, and you, like Michelangelo, you can use marble. You, can, you have the idea of a statue, let's suppose. Let's imagine Michelangelo with the idea of the David. He starts thinking about, hmm, I could do a statue of the David. And yeah, the David, um, just right after cutting Goliath's head, lifting the head and with the sword with Goliath, the giant Goliath sword in his other hand. And yeah, that this could work. Maybe I'm, I'm just imagining I'm Leonardo, not Leonardo, Michelangelo. So I, I can think a lot about it and I have a really good idea of what I want to do when I get the piece of marble. As long as I'm thinking about it, this David will go on existing in my head, right? As an, an, it's what it's called an ideal existence because an, it's, an, it's the idea of something that doesn't have a, like a concrete outside existence, uh, existence outside of my mind. I need the block of marble to sculpt that statue before this idea, before I forget about this idea or before I pass on and my idea passes on with me. So you have that advantage over God, if you're Michelangelo. You can grab a piece of marble and sculpt your statue, and there it is. You can stop thinking about it, you can, you can die, and the David is there. It's gonna stay there for, for centuries and century to, centuries to come. He doesn't depend on you. So, but if you are God, there is no marble for you. So you need to also create the marble. And here is the catch. As powerful as you are, you have the limitations, let's say, quote unquote limitations of your own unlimited being. 
this is it's gonna become a little bit clearer i hope later the perfection of your own nature that limits you to be perfect right it's, it's not that you you if you are god you have to be careful about not making errors it's just you will not make errors you will not make errors so you have that limit of not making errors like that's why i say quote unquote limits nobody will think of being perfect as a as a limit but in in, in a certain way it is because you cannot you cannot deviate you you will not that's the truth you will not because you are perfect you will not want to deviate from what is perfect so so it's the same it's synonym i think i'm going to talk about that later if there is something that you cannot do as god is to cheat you cannot violate the law of being because you my friend if you are god are being absolute being and you cannot belie what you are with your actions you cannot in your action suppose that you are not or that your being is somehow limited constrained by by some kind of essence you cannot all right so again i hope this is going to become more clear as we go because you are god you just are that this is a thing that confuses many many atheists and that is very difficult to maybe get your head around it but once you 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 manage to start thinking this way about god many many questions get answered just without even needing an answer because you realize that you were just asking the wrong questions I agree with many atheists that think that God is a thing. I don't think God is a thing. I agree with many atheists who th think that I believe in a being within time and space. I don't. I don't think God is within time and space. But what does, does it mean that you are not a thing? If you are God, you are not a thing. It means that you don't have an essence. And an, an essence is what sets limits to your being. All right? Uh, my essence, not your essence because you are God, so you don't have an essence. Basically, you, you are just pure being. My essence is that of a human being. Uh, essence is what, what we call the answer to the question, what is this? So if you looking at me asks, what is this or what are you? The question is, the answer, I'm sorry, is a human being. That's my essence. So what I am is limited by the essence of humanity. All right. I cannot be any other thing. I just has to constrain myself. <laughs> I don't have a choice really in that. I have to constrain myself to being human. Um, we want to be more sometimes, many times. I just, I just saw um, um, this little video of um, Will Smith saying that he he has to forgive himself for being human because he cannot. He hates being human. He would like to be something else. Maybe, maybe he would like to be. Like we all do, we would like to be more like, like a God. Because then we can decide what we are. But unfortunately, or fortunately, we don't decide what we are. We are limited by that essence, the humanity. So, but if you are God, you don't have a limit. That means that that's... that's where the word infinite comes from infinite means that in is the negation and f finite finite is comes from the latin word finis which means limits ends finis infinite so you your being doesn't have limits 
is infinite. You are infinite being. So therefore, the fact, pay attention to this because this is like a tricky, it sounds like a wordplay, but it's really not if you think about it carefully. This is where your lack of limitation can become a limit. There are things that you cannot do because your being doesn't have limits. You cannot, first of all, you cannot create something by thinking about another infinite being, right? Let's think about this for a second. Of course, we are the only, if you, if you are God, you are the only infinite being. Uh, because if, if, you, if you were able to create another infinite being, all, all you would be doing is creating yourself. And that's why there cannot be more than one God, because it's infinite being. And, and by definition, something that doesn't have limits doesn't allow for space for other beings. That's why on the ontological plane where God exists, which is all because it's existing the most basic, the one that doesn't have the limitation of essence, so it's, it's being is like the most basic ontological level. You cannot create something on that same level. You cannot create another being that doesn't have limits because there is no space, no ontological space for you to create that. So you are limited by your own unlimited being to create something that is limited. I hope this is clear enough because it's very important to have this clear and 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 we'll avoid many many um, pointless questions about God so you can you can think if you are God we're still thinking that you are God um, so you can think about the contours of, of the, the yeah the boundaries that will be the end essence as in, sometimes the philosophers use the word form because it's yeah, as a synonym of essence. Um, although the form would be more like the essence when it's applied to one instantiation of that essence in you know, one particular being. Okay, so you can think of the, those contours that will be the essence of a new creation of whatever you want to create. So you have the essence, the form in your head, like Michelangelo has the form or the essence, the idea, the idea of the David in his head, right? So, but that idea doesn't have concrete, real, is what we call real existence as opposed to ideal existence. Um, okay, so, you need the existence you, you, for anything to exist that is not God, that is not you, God, needs to think. Nothing, nothing in, in our experience, in our human experience, nothing, nothing exists without being something. Okay? When we say exist, we are talking about being. But when we talk about being, we are talking about essence too because there is nothing outside of God that we don't have a direct experience of God so in our in our direct experience there is nothing that doesn't have that limit of an essence so if you want to make your 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 the, the idea in your head real you need to join that idea, that essence, that ideal essence, to the existence, okay? Everything, everything that we know, like I said, has both being and essence, all right? The, the reason why we say that something is, that's what we call being. And the reason why we 
why we say that something is what it is, that's what the essence is, okay? So, if you are God, uh, if you are Michelangelo, you, you can, to give it existence to your idea, you can just grab something else from the created world, from the universe, in this case, marble. You can grab marble, put it, because mar the marble already has existence. So you, you can uh, imprint your idea, which would be the essence, into that marble, and then it, it ac acquires um, real existence from your ideal existence to the real existence thanks to the marble. But you are not Michelangelo, you are God. So you don't have the marble. You have to create the mar marble too. So you need to think of the essence of the marble. Of course, we all know by now that nothing is very simple nothing is simple at all in our universe so the marble is I, i'm not a very good scientist but i'm pretty sure that marble is made of other things like the atoms of the marble I maybe mean, marble is not just one thing but many different atoms of many different minerals and molecules and who knows what if you're a scientist you would know maybe if you're a geologist you would know what is in the marble so and probably those atoms that you are thinking of of marble also need other things like an atom is cannot be an atom is there is not not a an, a, an electron right a nucleus and an ele electron and, a, and you know you know what I'm talking about I hope but you can only think always of the essence in in your head in your godly head in your divine mind you have the essence but the essence of an atom is nothing if you don't have something else to attach existence to that atom all right so how does god do it because god cannot violate his own nature so he is pure being so he cannot take being out of non-being even if it is in his head so there is a confusion here that people um, usually get tangled up with this because the theologians christian theologians at least and muslim theologians probably too they talk about God's creation as a creation as ex nihilo in the, from the Latin, which means out of nothing, ex nihilo, out of nothing. But they are not talking about nothing in the sense of non-being. They are talking about nothing, no things. So from no things, from not, from something with an, that doesn't have an essence or an existence, I'm, I'm sorry, for, they are not talking about something that doesn't have existence. They are talking about something that doesn't have an essence. So it's a th something that would be a thing. So nothing can come out of nothing. When God creates out of nihilo, means, means that there is nothing with an essence. Nothing, there is no being with a limited with the with limiting essence, okay? So, so how, how, how does this happen? Um, I don't know. I, <laughs> but we can take a guess. We can take a guess, and, and that's, that's what theologians have concluded that God does. Um, and you know, because you are God, Right, so if you are God, you know that your divine being is unlimited. So that means it's open. So you are not enclosed by an essence. You are not a thing. So you can share your being with that idea you have in your head, the molecule of the atom, of the marble. 
All right? And that's how theologians think that the universe, universe comes to be. And within the universe, the whole universe, everything within it. So when, when God first created, which is kind of a weird thing to say first because God doesn't have time. So, but let's, let's suppose that he does have time. So when he first created and he first think of creating something, he first need to create a new ontological level because in, in his level, there cannot be anything else. He occupies all that level. So he creates a new ontological level, the level of limited being. And that's what we call it universe. Not really, actually. We call universe, the universe of uh, up to all the things that are not only limited by an essence, but are also limited by time and space. Okay, so um, but let's stick to the limit of the essence for now. We, we don't need to worry about uh, the limitations of time and space for now. So, how does this participation of the being of God in all the earth, in, in the universe? Well, first, God thinks about the universe, so the, the universe comes into being as a limited entity. As a, as a being limited by by, a, by an essence, so there is an essence of the universe, and because we can we can tell what the universe is, because it has limits. In, in a way, you cannot tell what you are if you are God, because you don't have limits. So when you say what something is, when you define something, is you set the limits to that something. That's why it's it's. Yeah, but we, think of things that we can say that are pretty, I think, pretty accurate, or they can be more or less accurate regarding a definition of God, but really, really defining God is impossible because he doesn't have limits to his being. So the entire universe exists is only because it participates in the being of God. In the same way, or not, not the same, but in a similar way, the moon illuminates, gives light, only because it participates in the light of the sun. Okay, the, This participation of being is done through God thinking of the essences. And that, that's the end of the similarity, right? The sun doesn't think of the essence of the moon, but God has to think of the essences or forms of those particular beings. Nevertheless, unlike the sun, that only shares light, which would be in this case the simile of being in the metaphor, and he doesn't need to worry about the essence of the moon and all the other essences that make it possible for the moon to exist and share light. God very much needs to remain concerned with all the essences that make the existence of the universe possible. Think of if you stop suddenly thinking about if it was even possible, the essence of the electrons, for example, then all the atoms of the world would, would disappear because you, you are holding those electrons in existence. You cannot stop thinking about those electrons because there is nothing else that can give reality to those electrons. All right, so you, if you are God, you cannot stop, stop thinking, okay? Watch it keep thinking about those electrons, about those protons and photons and and, and all, all the things that are necessary for the formation of first the atoms of helium and hydrogen. I think those are the first, the first things that came to be in the universe after the Big Bang, something like that. So you better, if you're God, you better keep thinking about electrons and all those things. So. This is in brief what theologians refer to when they say that God not only creates everything, but also maintains everything in existence, which is, is similar to saying that God creates from eternity. Mm -hmm. Eternity is, is basically is a negation of something. Is 
means that there is no time. So it's a dimension where God exists, that dimension we were talking about, that, level, that ontological level, there is no time there. There is no time in that ontological level. It's a timeless dimension. So when we say God creates, doesn't, and we, it's impossible for us to understand with the limitations, first with the limitations that we have of our being by, by the essence, by the human essence. But also it's in, even more impossible because we are also limited by, the, by time and space. But, um, so we use expressions like God is um, trying, trying to get out of the, of the problem. When you say God created, like the Bible says actually, God created, the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, is that literal? Like exactly like that? No. Not because it's impossible. We don't have words to explain how God is. And, and so we, we go by approximations. Right, it's like that that game, the the curling. Now I'm in Canada, that you can see. I'm in a hotel, I'm in Montreal. I'm not from here. I mean, I'm, I'm from Argentina. I, that's the accent. Uh, but I reside in the U.S. I've been residing in the U.S. for many many years, more than a quarter of a century already. And um, but here in Canada, they play that funny game where the slide is big. Some things I don't know what they are like rocks, or they slide it on ice and try to get closer to a target, uh, and th and that's what that's what we that's what we can do with God. We just try to get closer and closer and closer with our definitions, all limited, with our words, human words that are all limited. So never think that you are saying something very accurate about about God if you when somebody says something about God there is going to be some in some way a similar a similarity but the theologian says that whatever you say about God there is going to be a lot more that is dissimilar than what is similar okay um so be mindful of that. Let, let's just keep that in mind. Um, where was I? So to get out of the, the, the conundrum that God is outside of time. So when we say created, we're using the past. And there is no past for God because there is no time for God. So you could say that God constantly creates, is always creating. So this gives us the impression that the, there is a succession of moments in and each one of those moments God is creating. It's not like that. There are no moments. It's the, the best definition that we can find of etern, et, eternity is that of Boetius. Boetius? Boetius. I don't know how to say that name. Severinus Boetius. He was a, a monk that lived in the, I don't know, the nine hundreds? I think he was from the first millennium, and from the eighth century maybe. Um, and he wrote this beautiful treatise um, that is called the Consolation of Philosophy, and he gives lots of definitions there. It's, it's like a treasure of definitions, and one of them is about uh, the definition of eternity, and basically says that that. Eternity is like one moment, not a succession of moments, just one moment and it's always present. Okay, but anyway, I'm, I'm going off, I'm really going off um, on, on a rabbit holes. I don't want to do that, so let's keep on going. So when we say that God creates from a, from eternity, that means a timeless dimension, and and it would be we could say that God is constantly more appropriate would be even to say eternally creating, which might be closer to the way we perceive it. We perceive it as, as somebody is keeping this in existence, like moment by moment by moment. Okay. 
That's why the God of the Deists, I don't know if you heard about the God of the Deists, it's, it's like the watchmaker idea, like people who think that um, the Deists are those people who think that 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 is a God that created everything, but he just wind the clock and, and let it go and completely um, disconnected from from the universe, from his creation. He's totally unconcerned. And that is really not possible. Why? Because it would mean that at some ultimately basic point in the chain of essences required by other essences, we talked about that, right? We, we talked about how the essence of the David needs the essence of the marble. The essence of the marble needs the essence of the atom of whatever, marble. So in, in that chain, if, if God is unconcerned, unrelated to his creation, or disconnected, let's say, disconnected with his creation, that would mean that there is something in that chain of essences that exists, that has to exist independently from God. Get it? Why can Leonardo, not Leonardo, Michelangelo become unconcerned about the David because there is something that is not, the, that it doesn't, that, whose existence, the existence of the marble, doesn't depend on, the, on his own existence. All right? There is nothing. There is nothing that can exist independently from God. So God would be violating the infinite nature of his own being if it was true that the deist, what the deists think about God. So um, he, if he violates the infinite nature of his being, that would be proof that he is not really God. So the God of the deist really is not God. He doesn't exist really. Obviously this translates into God being the unavoidable source of all being. I think that's pretty clear by now, right? And if the obvious teleology of being is to remain in being, this is another question that I guess it can be explained quickly. I don't want to keep on going on rabbit holes because this is going to take forever otherwise. Teleology is uh, a certain aim that, that certain things have uh, according to theists, believer, believers in God, like me, we think that everything has a teleology. Everything, because everything was made by, by the mind of God, by the mind. So nobody, no intelligent agent makes something for no reason, without a purpose. So since we believe that God created everything, everything has to have a, a, a teleology, like an aim, a purpose in the mind of the Creator. And there is one basic, basic teleology that everything has, which is to remain in being. We can see that. We can see that in the, in the, in the, in the, in the fact that things are, and the next moment they are, they, they are still there. Unless somebody does something to make them disappear, they will tend, because they have that aim of remaining in being, embedded. In, in, in themselves, in their being. So, so if, the, if this obvious teleology of being, to remain in being, it follows that God cannot, that's a funny thing that you might be surprised to hear that God cannot do things, and I guess you, in this presentation, you've heard a couple of times that God cannot do many things. So, the, the obvious theology of being is to remain in being, so God cannot create anything whatsoever without any other purpose than to remain united to himself, if he is the source of all being. Let me say this again. If the obvious teleology of being is to remain in being, it follows that God cannot create anything 
without any other purpose than to remain, remain united to himself because he's a source of all being. Otherwise, we would have to believe in the absurdity of a God that creates something for no purpose, for nothing. Create something for, for it to disappear instantly. For the moment that get disconnected from that source of being that is himself, disappears. That's why um, that challenge or complaint that many atheists have about God. Why God creates us and wants us to love him? Because that, that's the way we remain united to the source of being, right? He, God cannot... <laughs> cannot have any other aim in his mind when he creates than he himself than to that's why we, we say that all creation proceeds from God and goes back to God okay that's 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 the point that's the whole that's the whole point because and that's why God cannot avoid being the end of cre of his creation otherwise he would be creating something for nothing right so going back to the beginning to the question why God is um, why do I think that God what was the question why would you think that God is morally superior to any other thinking entity all right morality think about what morality is morality is a set of rules that is supposed to guide free beings towards the achievement of the end of their nature we, we can call that end we can call it we also call it good what is good for something um, when you say when what is good for a cat we are talking about the the end of the nature of cat or, or the essence of cat I don't want to start talking about nature now because that's another, another like nuance on, on the on on the concept of essence. So everything has has a purpose, and um, that purpose is the end or the good of the thing. And that's what morality is. Morality is because morality, first of all, can only be talked about free beings, beings like us, human beings, who have the power to act according to our good or to act against our good. And that's undeniable. I think that we know many cases, I'm sure everybody knows of at least a couple of examples of people who act against their own good. Even if we don't agree of, of what the ultimate good, if, if, even if you don't agree with what I just said, that the ultimate good of, of, of human beings and of all creation is to remain united with God or to reunite with God if, if we became um, disunited, um, severed from from the source of all being. Even if you question that, you know from experience that there are things that you think they are good and the, you know that there are people who act against those goods. So morality can only be applied to people who can deviate from their own good, okay, from their own end. And since that end is, is God, because it cannot be anything that deviates from the source of all being, God is outside of, of the realm of, the, of, of what we call morality. Morality doesn't make sense in relation to beings that, like God, that is already perfect, that is already, that there is no other way that God can be. So, because morality is a set of rules that guide you towards something better, to, towards your good, all right? So it doesn't, 
the, the, it's, it's absurd to talk about God being moral or immoral. Okay? It, all, morality only, remember this, morality only makes sense in relation to beings that have not yet achieved their end. If we say that God has not achieved his own end, we are not talking about God, we are talking about something else. All right? Because God's end, what is God's end? If he, if we were talking, if we were a, it doesn't make sense to talk about a purpose of what, what is God's purpose. It's kind of, kind of a silly question, but if, if we could talk about it, we would be, we would say that if since he is being a limited being, his end, his purpose will be to keep being, to simply be, which is himself, being it. Is God. God is being. Being is God. So he has to be its own end. Therefore, morality is not a concept applicable to God. It just doesn't make sense. By the way, for God to be and remain in being, to be and to remain in being, all he has to do is to be faithful to his nature. Basically, he has to remain being God, so he does, doesn't have to do anything, really. Just be. And to finish this, because this is getting a little bit too long, that nature, before I said that nature is like a, a nuance on the concept of essence, and that it refers to that teleology that I was talking about before, that every essence is created for a purpose, uh, so nature is that that aspect of the essence that um, also encompasses the the behavior. Let's say the behavior of, of of the thing towards its own end, towards its own good. So um, so that's why. That's another definition by Boethius, Boethius um, that nature is the, is the essence as a principle of operations, of those operations of, that guide, that not guide, that takes us or takes things to their own end. This would be for another for another day, for another episode of the post podcast to explain why we say that the nature of God, the Christian God, is love. Um, that's one of the definitions that, that we really try. <laughs> and I think that's probably the one that gets closest to what God is, to who God is. Uh, he's, he's a relationship. And that relationship is a relationship of love. And that's why we Christians really need a plurality of persons in the in the Godhead, in the divinity. Um, because otherwise there is no relationship possible. If God if God's very nature is love, a relationship of love, you need two um, entities, if you will, capable of loving and being loved, which is what we call person. Um, okay, that's why we say that um, that God is a trinity of persons: Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And therefore, to give closure to this issue, to this theme to this matter, to this question. God cannot cease to love. I think I already answered the question. The question doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because you cannot apply morality, which is, which refers to rules that guide behavior towards an end. You cannot apply that to a being that is perfect 
because there is no point in, in for that being to to do anything to do anything at all because a relationship in relation to to who he is to what he is because the only point for behaving for acting is to to become more perfect to do something that is better than what we have besides that so because god is love god cannot cease to love the moment he does if he could which he can't because he won't because he's perfect it will only prove that he wasn't god after all and we can talk about this is another subject for another day if god is going to be truly god and truly perfect he has to be love he has to be a relationship of love and we leave that in suspense for another time thank you very much for listening for watching if you're watching i hope you are not watching just listening and yeah even if you're only listening i kind of feel bad for you because i'm not really good with with words but anyway thank you very much and until the next time.